Hi guys and welcome to this video uh, where we'll be looking at uh, volume versus pressure control ventilation. We'll be looking at the clinical experience of both uh, and we'll have a brief introduction to scalars which are these uh, waveforms which differ over time. Right, so before we get into it, probably need to look at what the goals of ventilation are. Uh, and these, the goals of ventilation are making sure that we get acceptable oxygenation and acceptable carbon dioxide clearance. Um, but that will depend on one, what our blood gas targets are. So they could either be normal or we might have permissive hypoxia or permissive hypercarbia. And these things depend on what sort of lung we're attempting to ventilate. While we're trying to get those gases, however, we'll be trying to make sure that the driving pressure, if we if we're ventilating normal lungs, isn't greater than 10 centimeters of water, and I'll discuss that a little bit later. And also, we don't want very high peak or plateau pressures, so we try and limit those to within 28 to 32. Now, tidal volumes are different uh, depending on what type of lung we're trying to achieve, uh, what type of lung we're trying to ventilate. Um, but we try and make sure that tidal volume is appropriate for that sort of lung and the values that we uh, try and ventilate to are over here. Remember, of course, that there are special circumstances. So some of these um, uh, goals change. Uh, depending on the special circumstance, and I will have videos on these uh, a little later. Um, but rest assured that both pressure and volume um, will adequately ventilate lungs and will achieve these goals. So if you allow me to park oxygenation to one side just for a moment, um, if you allow me to do that, then I will tell you that volume is king. Volume is better than pressure. And why would I say that? Uh, because volume is all about, or ventilation is all about minute ventilation, um, because it's all about removing CO2 that is being created by basic human metabolism. So that needs to be removed, and the only and best way it can be done um, is by breathing that out. So therefore, making sure you have some control over the minute ventilation. And purely because of this, volume ventilation is best for most patients. But it's not best for all patients. So if you've got a big leak around a tube, for instance, um, volume ventilation is very bad at dealing with this particular sort of situation, which is, well, so this combined with some other reasons means that there are indications where pressure or situations where pressure would be better. Now, paediatricians and neonatologists, they love the pressure modes of ventilation and with good reason. So the problem that you get with respiratory distress syndrome is a diffuse, which is a diffuse alveolar disease, is that you get very stiff lungs requiring you to manipulate the mean airway pressure in order to get adequate oxygenation. That coupled with the fact that there's expected to be a leak around the endotracheal tube means that uh, volume ventilation probably isn't always best for these sorts of patients. We can also add to that that the decelerating flow that you get from a pressure style breath leads to a lot less ventilator asynchrony as the flow arrives very quickly in the initial part of inspiration. This isn't so with a volume style continuous flow breath. So a quick sum up of the volume versus pressure argument is that for volume, um, adults prefer it um, for good reasons. Um, you set volumes, but then if you set the volumes, you have to check what pressures are being generated. You have a preset tidal volume and that tidal volume will be deliver, delivered regardless of the peak pressure and also regardless of any leaks in the system. And the type of breath it is, is a continuous flow breath. And we'll get on to what the breath types are shortly. When you compare that with pressure, the neonatologists prefer uh, pressure style ventilation. Um, and when you set the pressure, you have to check which volumes 
uh, are, are measured uh, to make sure you're getting the sort of tidal volume that you expect. When you compare volume and pressure, you get the best value pip for mean airway pressure with a pressure style breath. Now, what do I mean with that? If you've got a volume breath and a pressure breath, and both of them have the same mean airway pressure, if you check the peak inspiratory pressure, the volume breath will have a higher peak inspiratory pressure. Um, this isn't an advantage. This is not what we're looking to achieve because we're trying to prevent lung ventilator associated lung injury. So from that point of view, pressure is sometimes better. And obviously I've mentioned earlier, the breath type for a volume breath will be a continuous flow breath and for a pressure breath will be a decelerating flow breath. And I'll go into more details of that shortly. Now we have been talking about volume versus pressure we really should have been talking about flow because it's flow that actually generates these breaths. So here we have two waveforms of different style ventilator breaths. So these is this this is this these waveforms are actually scalars which you find on the ventilator uh, and they're very useful things to actually keep your eye on. So this is a flow scala. So it's looking at the flow of the ventilator on the y-axis versus time. So flow versus time. And on the left hand side here, we have um, a volume style breath. And on the right, we have a pressure style breath. So if we start with the volume style breath, what you'll find that we have um, is that we have a constant flow. So the start flow is zero, so there's no flow at this point. Then we go into inspiration. So this is inspiration, this entire period here. So what you find happens in a volume breath, you just get a constant flow throughout inspiration. So you get a constant flow until the set target volume that is reached, after which no more flow continues, but we're still in inspiration. Um, and then we then cycle round into expiration and then the patient then starts to expire. So you then get reverse flow and, 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 and then it diminishes back to zero waiting for the next breath to come. So that's a constant flow. And that what you, what you get in volume ventilation, that contrasts with what you get in pressure ventilation, which is a decelerating flow. And what happens in decelerating flow is that you actually start off with a very high flow rate which then drops over time. Yep, so you get a very high flow rate to get you to the preset pressure, but then you need less flow to keep it at that preset pressure until flow then drops to zero. But this is also still inspiration. Um, and then you'll cycle into expiration um, and therefore the flow then reverses and goes the opposite way. Now this is called a decelerating flow breath and the advantage that I mentioned earlier that the decelerating flow breath has over the constant flow breath is for the same mean airway pressure the peak inspiratory pressure will be lower with the pressure style decelerating flow breath. So if you've not um, heard of scalars before this is a good time to actually get involved uh, with them. So Scalars are waveforms which um, change over time. And there are three of them that are very important for us during ventilation. So the top here, we have the pressure time um, waveform. So there, how does the pressure vary over time? Then we have the flow time scala. So looking at how the flow varies over time. And we have the volume time scala, looking at how volume varies over time. And we're going to look at those in um, some more detail now. So these are the scalars that you can expect to find on your ventilator as I mentioned earlier. So we've got volume time on top, flow time um, on, in the middle, and pressure time underneath. And these are the volume control scalars over here. And over here we have pressure scalars over here and it's good to look at them like this so that we get a, a good feel of 
of, of, of what's going on. So if we start with the volume oriented scalars and we start with the most important one, which is flow. So what happens, you have a constant flow here and then flow then stops when the set target tidal volume has been delivered. Uh, and then you, because in, your high time hasn't finished, you have a period of zero flow before you then cycle into expiration. So the period here is the time that you actually get to your maximum pressure. Yeah, so looking at the, with this continuous flow. Then when there's no flow, that's where you get your plateau pressure. So you can see here, this is flow gradually increasing the pressure, and then you get to your maximum or your peak inspiratory pressure. Then the period of no flow coincides with this area here, which is what we call the plateau pressure before you then cycle into expiration and then you get reverse flow with the pressure dropping back uh, to the value of PEEP. So that's what happens um, with your average volume style breath. If we come over here and look at the pressure oriented style breath, flow starts off very quickly um, and then afterwards starts to decelerate. So as the flow starts off very quickly, you get to your peak pressure very quickly. And then flow decelerates and gets slower. And even when there's zero flow, the pressure remains the same. So you don't need, you need a lot of flow to actually inflate the lung to start off with. And then you need less flow to maintain the pressure there. And that's why you've got this flat top pressure scala. Um, and then I think at the end of your inspiratory time, you then cycle into expiration and there you can see the pressure drops here. Now the volume scala is not as informative as the other two, but it's still worth a quick look. So on a volume style breath, um, you have this continuous flow that goes in. So therefore the volume going into the lung increases. Then you get to your plateau pressure where there is no flow uh, and therefore the volume plateaus off. There's no increase in volume and then you get a drop in volume with expiration. If we look at the decelerating flow breath, what you see is the volume gradually increases uh, even as the flow decelerates, but the rate at which it increases also um, drops off and then flattens off. And then there's a time when there's no flow, which is this time here. So there's no increase in volume and then you cycle into expiration um, and, and come out that way. So these are very important because <clears throat> if you examine them over time, they can tell you all sorts of things of what's happened to the patient. You can tell if the patient actually wants more flow and isn't synchronizing with the vent. You can tell if there are secretions in the, in the situation. You can tell if the eye time is too long or too short. You can also tell if the expiratory time is too long or too short. So all these things you can get from, from, from the scalars and I will go through those as we come across them, in, uh, as we come across clinical situations in videos to come. How do the settings for volume control and pressure control differ? So some of the settings are the same and then we've got a, a few different ones when, and, and we've got a few different settings um, also. So we should look at these briefly here and then I shall go to our little simulator and, and, and demonstrate them there. So first of all, the FiO2, the eye time and PEEP and respiratory rate are the, you, you get these in both pressure and volume control. So they would all need to be set and they would be similar. What you have different between them, in volume control, you'll have tidal volume, which would need to be set and a flow that would need to be set. In pressure control, you've got the same FiO2, inspiratory time, respiratory rate and PEEP, but instead of flow, you've got this slope, which translates as an inspiratory rise time, and you have the maximum pressure or your, your PIP or pressure of inspiration. 
that you set here instead of the title volume. So now I'm going to go over to the simulator and, and, and show you how these things differ and we'll look at the scalars at the same time. Right, up next, the simulator. Well, ladies and gentlemen, so we're now ventilating a 10 kilo, 77 centimeter baby. Um, and we've started him off in volume control CMV. And we can see what the basic settings are. So the ventilators decided based on the patient's age, size and weight uh, uh, that if he has normal lungs, we should consider an FiO2 of 21 a tidal volume of 50 mils, an inspiratory time of 0.69, a respiratory rate of 29, a PEEP of 5, and the flow is automatically set at 6. And we'll talk about a little bit about the flow in a bit. Right, so the FiO2 is self-explanatory, and I have nothing really much to add there. The tidal volume, however, is very important. Uh, and the way the tidal volume is actually married to the eye time and the flow. So those three are, are, are related and once you change one, it has an impact on the others. But let's take us through this now. So this is a classical volume curve because we know this because the flow time scala has a nice flat top, which is what you get with a continuous flow. Uh, and you can see this is after the set volume of 50 mils is delivered flow is then stopped uh, and uh, because of that you get this plateau pressure at this level here so that tells us it's a it's a good uh, volume uh, sort of mode so that's the first thing now the other thing we see is that you've got an eye time here of 0.69 and an expiratory time over here of 1.4 so adds up to two seconds so if you've got almost like 30 breaths in 60 seconds um, then each breath is going to take about two seconds so you hear zero two four six eight and so on so split it up into sort of like two se second segments and you should get one breath in each of those two second segments so if we start off with the with the tidal volume so the tidal volume of 50 mils uh, will affect the minute volume here. So if I increase the tidal volume, you'd expect the minute volume to increase. The PIP will also increase and and the mean airway pressure will also increase because the PIP has increased. So those things um, we can sort of like expect to happen. However, if you try and increase the tidal volume, so at the moment it's five per kilo, let's say I want it to go to seven per kilo, what you'll see happen is I get a warning to say that if you want to adjust it any more than six per kilo, which is 60 mils, I will need to adjust the flow button. So if I confirm that I want to adjust the flow button, the flow button here lights up as well. So now I can now continue to give him 70 mils and accept, and the flow has increased from six liters per minute to seven liters per minute. And it's done that because you can't actually deliver a flow of Seven, uh, you can't actually deliver a tidal volume of 70 mils 29 times with a flow of 6 litres per minute. That's effectively what, it, what, what this is telling you. So now that we've increased it, you see that the minute volume has increased. So it's now 2 litres per minute. You see the PEEP remains the same, but the PIP has gone up, uh, as has the mean airway pressure. So I shall return these to normal now while we then go on and examine the inspiratory time. So, sorry, put this back to 50 where it was. Boom. And watch the pip drop, and we'll watch the minute volume drop back to where they were. So the I time is 0 0.69, and we've got an E time of 1.4, giving us uh, a two second cycle and an in, uh, and an IE ratio, inspiratory expiratory ratio of one to two. Yeah. If we increase that inspiratory time, let's go to 0.8 or closer to 0.9. 
what you'll find is your one year IE ratio has, has changed. You've increased the amount of time that the breath can go into, and then, uh, but the, the breath didn't actually need that much time. So what you then have is a longer zero flow time with a longer time for peak inspiratory pressure. Yeah, and you can see how flat topped the volume time scala is. So it's only 52 mils going in, so it doesn't need 0.8 seconds. This would be unphysiologic, and if the baby were awake and trying to breathe, you wouldn't be best pleased with this, and therefore you might run into problems with ventilator asynchrony. So I shall just return that um, to its normal value of 0.69. Sorry, it takes a while. There we go. If you've got an eye time that is too short, what can happen is one, you can peak the inspiratory pressure, which is not what you want to do. So your PIP can go up higher than we necessarily want it to. So I'm going to drop it to see if we can drop it to 0.5. Let's see what happens there. So there you go. So the other thing it asked is that if your inspiratory time is is too low, you're ask you're going to need to increase the flow rate. So the flow rate there automatically adjusted itself to seven again, um, and you can actually see a difference in the curve here. So the pressure time curve again very pointy. There's absolutely no time at all for there to be any zero flow. So therefore you've got this peaked volume scala uh, no zero flow um, on the flow scala and no plateau pressure for the uh, for the pressure scala now is this useful clinically sometimes it is useful if you need to shorten the inspiratory time to allow the patient to breathe out uh, to give the patient more time to breathe out um, so to do that, one, you need to drop the eye time, but two, you need to increase the flow. So I shall try and put these things back to normal while we go on and look at the respiratory rate. So it's 0.69. There we go, and the flow can return to six. Right, so if you increase the respiratory rate, the things that will happen, obviously, is the minute volume will increase. Uh, and because you've got, and, and also the mean airway pressure may go up, um, a, a, a bit as well um, if the rate goes up too high you would also need to consider increasing the flow to meet the demand that you're given because now you you've got an increased minute volume you'd need more flow to feed that minute volume so that's all we have with the rate I think other thing to remember about the rate is that it's a glorified expiratory time knob so basically what you're doing when you're adjusting the rate is adjusting the expiratory time um, uh, and, and adjusting the IE ratio rather than actually changing the rate. It just calculates the rate in the background. Uh, so that's the other thing to remember. When you increase PEEP in a volume mode, what you're going to do is increase the PEEP, increase the PIP, and increase the mean airway pressure, but the volumes will remain the same. So let's see what happens when we try and increase this PEEP here. So we'll increase it to six and confirm. So PEEP's gone up, PIP's gone up, Mean airway pressure has gone up, total volume and minute volume 
remain the same. However, if you get improvement in alveolar recruitment from that, the, the tidal volumes and the minute volume could also actually go up with time. That wouldn't happen immediately, but if you come back and, and look at the patient the next 20, 30 minutes, you might, might see some improvement there. So that's important. The flow is also very important. And the most important thing about the flow is you need to leave it alone and let the ventilator make those flow decisions for you unless you actually know what you're doing. If you give the patient too much flow for no good reason, the only thing you're going to do is peak the inspiratory pressure. So the, the peak inspiratory pressure will go up unnecessarily. And then the plateau pressure will also change. So there you go. So the peak inspiratory pressure has increased because what you've done, he only needs 52 mils and he's got 14 liters per minute. Therefore that 52 mils happens very quickly, but at an increased pressure. So therefore when the zero flow happens, it happens one for a lot longer time. So you've got a plateau pressure, which is there for longer. Um, but there's no real benefit from that. And actually it might be quite injurious to the patient. So the flow button is something that needs to be left alone. It needs to be left, uh, left alone. There are some clinical situations when it's useful. So um, it's like when you want to shorten the eye time, you might need to use a little bit of increased flow. Let's just put this back to where it was. Okay, so that's a swift look through what can happen um, when you use volume control. Let's have a look at pressure control CMV and see how that differs or whether it differs in any way. So look under other modes, go to pressure control CMV and confirm. Excellent. So here we have FiO2, inspiratory time, respiratory rope. We've got this thing called slope which we'll talk about in a minute. And you've got the set uh, peak inspiratory pressure and a peep. Now, the first thing to notice is that we were ventilating this child with a tidal volume of five mils per kilo. With a pressure of 15, patient is getting 65 mils total, which is about six and a half mils per kilo. So therefore that tells us immediately that with these current settings, there is space to drop this peak inspiratory pressure. So with this peak pressure, with this inspiratory time and this peep, I can get a tidal volume of 51 mils or five per kilo. It would be so much easier for me to just volume ventilate this child and dial in 50 mils, uh, 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 dial in this 50 mils or five mils per kilo because that's, a much easier way of doing things. However, this is how you do it if you want to pressure ventilate someone. Now, FiO2 again, self-explanatory, nothing to say about that. If you increase the peak inspiratory pressure, what happens is that will go up. The tidal volume will also go up and the minute volume will increase. The area, area of dark blue will increase and the area of dark blue is called the area under the curve and the area under the curve represents the mean airway pressure. So if I just put it up by, let's say two to 14. So the PIP's gone from to 14. The mean airway pressure's increased to 7.7. .7. The tidal volume's increased to 65 and the, and the minute volume's increased to 1.7. So, when you increase the PIP, I'm not sure that's, we wanted to do all those things, but those are the things that happen as a result. So therefore you've always got to check all the other settings when you make that kind of maneuver. Now, if you adjust the PIP, what happens? So if I increase the PIP, what you'll find will happen is that the tidal volume will now reduce. So the, what we call the driving pressure or the, is the difference between the peak inspiratory pressure and the peak. And the smaller that is, the smaller your tidal volume. So therefore now you've seen you by increasing the peak by one from five to six, you can see that tidal volume has 
has dropped by a few mils therefore the minute volume will drop by a few mils and so this will knock off ventilation but since the peep's gone up the pip will remain the same but the mean airway pressure will go up and as that's gone up you will improve oxygenation so you've got this balancing act and changing one thing to improve one side of the equation um, is quite often going to have an opposite um, unnecessary or unwanted effect on the other side of the equation so that isn't always true it isn't always predictable so therefore anytime you change it just come back and see what your result has what you're what you're left with now the i time we mentioned earlier but this slope button um you don't have that in volume modes you have them in pressure modes uh, and what your and what it actually is is a uh, is an inspiratory rise time so in other words it's about how long does it take for the pressure to go from peep to pip during inspiration so here we've got an eye time of approximately 0 0.7 0 0.2 of that eye time is actually the rise time leaving 0.5 of that eye time as the sustain time so from here to here is 0.2 of a second and the rest of this is 0.5 so the whole inspiratory time is equal to 0.7 seconds now if you drop this slope value what will happen is the breath will get to its peak pressure sooner with the result being that one the mean airway pressure will increase and two the tidal volume will also increase so you can actually drop it to zero and we, and we do that sometimes when we've got a particularly difficult or uh, non-compliant lung to ventilate um, uh, and what that does it makes this scala more like a square wave so you can notice how this is now almost perpendicular uh, to the baseline so in other words as soon as inspiration begins it, you, you get straight to your maximum pressure which in this case is 14 um, and with that you get a slight increase very slight increase in tidal volume you get an increase also in the mean airway pressure now because this slope volume forms part of the um, inspiratory time it can't be longer than the inspiratory time so if I tried to set it to longer than the inspiratory time what you would find is the ventilator would warn me about this and wouldn't let me do it so if I try to set a slope of 0.69 it would say that's the entire inspiratory time and if I did set it like that the things that would happen would be one the tidal volume would drop off and as a result the minute volume would also drop off and because you have less time in inspiration the mean airway pressure would also drop so I don't think I'll go all the way to 0.69 let's see if we can get it to 0.4 and we can look at the different waveforms and see what they look like I've put it up to 0.69 and look how different shape that is so it's taken the entire inspiratory time to get to the target volume of 14 and a result of that is the tidal volume has dropped the minute volume has also dropped um, and therefore uh, we're not actually getting what we wanted so my advice leave the slope alone unless you know exactly what you're doing so that's all i've got here let's get back to the let's get back to the rest of the video guys i'm um, starting to wrap things up volume or pressure well it's really quite simple for most patients you need to have control of the minute volume um so therefore um, you need to set the tidal volume and the rate to control the minute volume directly but when you do that you need to check what pip and mean airway pressure is happening with those settings and know that these things are going to vary as the patient's chest uh, changes um, and also as he wakes up and starts to join in himself 
we set pressure when we need to have a better control of the mean airway pressure. So therefore, if we're struggling with oxygenation, um, we're going to manipulate the I time, the PEEP and the PIP um, to get the mean airway pressure we want. However, in the back of our minds, we need to remember that the tidal volumes and the minute volume will vary so that when we change any of these things, we need to make sure we're happy with the resultant tidal volume and minute volume. Well, these are the main differences and they're all things that we've addressed earlier on in the video, but they're just here to try and help you cement some of that information. And here are some of the practical differences. So what's the difference between volutrauma and barotrauma? That's the topic for a discussion on another day. Um, but if you set pressure, sometimes um, the volumes can go very high. And if you set volumes, sometimes the pressure go very high. All in all, if you're looking for alveolar recruitment, pressure control is probably better. And if you have leaks, again, pressure control is probably better. But you should remember, whichever you decide on volume or pressure, the ventilation and oxygenation are going to vary with changes in the lung characteristics. And therefore, you need to be mindful of this. If we take into consideration uh, patient comfort, then sometimes the high initial flow rate that you get with a pressure breath leads to a lot less ventilator asynchrony, which you can sometimes see in volume control ventilation. So that's all I've got for you today on this one, ladies and gentlemen. We've been looking at volume control versus pressure control ventilation. We've been looking at how the adults uh, do it and the pediatric take on it. And we've looked at some of the clinical implications while having a brief introduction to Scarless. Next up, we'll be looking at some of the additional settings that you can get on the ventilator. I hope to see you all on that one.